Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this particular series is a very fascinating one on the book of Luke. These lessons cover a period we will be studying them from April, May, and June of 2015. And this particular lesson is lesson number six in that series entitled, Women in the Ministry of Jesus. I don't remember there any disciples who were named were women. Where, where did these ladies come from? I was going to point that out. <laughs> okay, so we'll see what we can find out. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for the privileges we have to have the, the records of Scripture so readily available in multiple languages and multiple translations as we seek to dig out some of these finer details uh, in the records of, of Dr. Luke of so long ago. Help us as we open these records that we may learn the lessons we need to learn and how they might apply to us in the 21st century is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Some of you probably know that the Gospel of Luke is famous, or as some people would say infamous, for being so favorable to women. Many early Christians rejected Luke's Gospel for that very reason. We can rejoice that Jesus rose above the cultural norms of his day to involve so many women whose needs he met and to whose love he responded. It's a well-known fact that in the cultures of Jesus' day, including the Greek and Roman cultures, the status of women was very low. They were little more than property. They were to be used or abused by men more or less at will. They had few legal rights and were often nothing more than sex slaves. Is it any wonder that women were attracted to Jesus considering that, that background? Jesus called them daughters of Abraham. And the reference is there in Luke 13, 16. So, um, what do you think of that background? Are we, have, we, have we gotten away from that completely? We still have a little bit of that kind of problem in our day. Patches of it around the world, aren't there? Yeah, some parts of the world are still very, very much alive. As well, I recall, there's a fairly current discussion about the role of women in the church. Yes, not just our church, in lots of churches. That's right. Yeah. Well, to talk about women, we know that the story of Jesus begins with women. The story of the human story of Jesus begins with women, doesn't it? Gabriel appeared to whom? To Mary, and said, you're going to have a baby. Jesus says, how can that be? I don't have any men around me. And Jesus said, and the Spirit said to her, well, don't worry, we can take care of that. And for, their, for that reason, your, your baby will be called the Son of God. And that baby had started having impact on other people even before he came out of his uterus. Because what happened when Mary... Now, why do you, first of all, why do you suppose Mary departed apparently singly by herself on a long journey to visit her, her cousin down in Judea. She traveled from, from Galilee to Judea as a single woman, which is <clears throat> a scary kind of a thought in those days. Uh, why do you suppose she did that? Anybody have an idea? She might have had a message from the other side, uh, the, the mother of John the Baptist. There were relatives, so maybe she got word of a pregnancy there and wanted okay. to come down and see what's going on. That's a possibility. Anybody else have an idea? Do you suppose that she made the trip to a distant land because of the pregnancy to kind of keep away from society of the day? And all the accusing accusations yeah. and so forth, yeah. very I likely. The society of that day, or the society of every day. Yeah, very, very likely. And when she got there to visit her her cousin Elizabeth, what happened? Do you remember? Well, the, the baby in Elizabeth's womb, the Bible says, leapt at the, yes. at the response. One very interesting translator from some days ago who felt the Bible was using way too much common language <laughs> <laughs> came to that passage and said, he translated it, the embryo was joyfully agitated. 
<laughs> I thought that was quite good. How, how much farther along was Elizabeth than? Uh, about six months. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, about six months ahead. So Mary probably stayed until about the time John was born, maybe a little bit later, probably, actually. Do you think uh, Mary broke the news of what was happening to her and the angel's visit and all that to prior to the visit, or that You mean did she send an email? Well, <laughs> just a phone call. <laughs> Donkey or something, I don't know, before or she, that, it was at that event she said, look, you know, guess what? happening here? I, I think probably that was their first time to find out, would be my guess. But they weren't the only ones preparing for the Messiah. The whole Jewish nation claimed to be preparing for the Messiah, but someone at the temple also had something to say. Do you remember? Simeon was told that he would not die until he saw the Messiah. And who was responsible? Who, who was it that told Simeon that? Do you remember? It was Anna? an angel, wasn't it? It was the Holy Spirit, he says. Yeah. The Spirit told me, right? Luke 2. Well, <clears throat> and there was Anna too as well that was aware that um, she said, this baby has been given to all who are waiting for God to set Jerusalem free. And I have to ask a, a challenging question at, that, at, that, at this point. Um, what do you think these women that are starring in our program so far, what do you think they thought this Messiah was going to do? Mm -hmm. It would be king. Free them from the Romans. Free them from the Romans. They were looking for a Jewish king who had the stuff that David was made out of, didn't, weren't they? Yeah. Well, if Simeon and Anna, we kind of talk about them together, if, if they were told by the Holy Spirit, maybe they had a more correct understanding of what Jesus was going to do. That would be nice, but as I look at the history of even the disciples, they couldn't seem to get that message until after the, the death and the resurrection. Yeah. So I don't know, to suggest that Anna and Simeon got it before his birth is a little bit of a stretch, I'm afraid. Well, even at the wedding feast at Cana, yeah. um, Jesus kind of corrected Mary there a little bit about certain things, so. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, Mary, what we, well, I'm sorry, what it says about Anna is she was telling everybody, the Messiah is here, the Messiah is here. Do you think she spoke to the Sadducees and the Pharisees, telling them that Jesus said, well, that the Messiah had arrived? Would they speak to her? <laughs> well, yeah, would they speak to her? That would be the other question. Well, we go along, we now move along, and now we come into the ministry of Jesus. In Luke 7, verses 11 to 17, if you have your Bible, you might want to open to that. We read about a very interesting story. Jesus and his disciples are traveling apparently from Nazareth back to Capernaum, which Jesus declared was, it would be his home during his ministry. And what happened is they were, now, this small town of Nain is on a kind of a bit of a plateau, and you have to start, sort of climb up a fairly steep hill to get into the village, what happened as they were climbing up that hill? They saw a funeral procession. <laughs> okay. And try to picture this in your mind. They, in those days, they tended not to use caskets. The body would be, be wrapped in inappropriate claws and just lying on an open bier, and there would be probably four, maybe six men carrying this body on a, on a kind of stretcher on their shoulders, and they're walking down the hill, and all the mourners wailing and so forth and carrying on, because here was a woman who was a widow, and she had just lost her only son. Was the body wrapped up? Yeah. Yeah, almost certainly. Yeah. <coughs> um, and what happened? Well, she was crying because she would depend on him in her old age for her sustenance, and she'd lost it with him dying. And what else happened? Christ took pity on her. <laughs> Jesus and his disciples were coming up the hill. And I, I, I always, when I read a story like this, I always ask myself, do you think this was just by accident that Jesus happened to be there? No. Probably not. Probably not an accident. He just died that very day, hadn't he? You know, oh, yeah. Probably they get rid of the, yeah. they bury the body. Supposed to be buried the same day. Potential for disease, uh, mm -hmm. cleanliness and so mm -hmm. forth. 
By so, your statement, you aren't suggesting that Jesus and the Holy Spirit knew this ahead of time and were exactly. planning this, are you? I exactly intend to mean that. <laughs> then say it straightforward. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> they planned it, and Jesus went that way on purpose. And there you are coming into this town, and he said to the lady, don't cry. And he walked over to the young man. I, I'm trying to imagine, you know, here's a lady that, you know, here's a stranger. She probably didn't, I'm, I'm quite sure she had no idea who Jesus was. He just, don't cry. He walks over to the, the, the men, and they stopped. And, you know, and everybody's sort of, okay, what's going to happen next? I mean, try to imagine it in your mind. And he just walks up and says, young man, Get up, I tell you. And he starts to move. And I don't know whether, <laughs> if you were one of the ones carrying the beer, would you freak out? Drop him. I was tempted to drop it. <laughs> yeah, <I laughs> inclined to just drop him. Well, you Jesus. Wonder also, the, por the amount of time between the don't cry yeah. and going to the body and saying, what, you know, what is this? person saying to us, so, you know, how bizarre that would be, don't cry over your son. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's like, huh? Yeah. W don't you know my son is dead? There he is on this being carried to his burial. Yeah. Well, in the next story we come, we're just hitting some stories that involve women. The next story we come to is the story of Jairus and his daughter. What, what do we know about that story? Who was Jairus? He, he was a... He was a, a government notable, wasn't he? Something no, not exactly. Synagogue not exa notable. Oh, I know. He was the ruler of the synagogue. synagogue. He made sure things ran smoothly. Right. It was his job to pick out every week who would read the scripture, you know, give a presentation or whatever, whatever was going in, on in the synagogue. That was his job. He was in charge of what went on at the, at the was church. Was he a Sadducee? Was he a Sadducee if he's in charge of the Probably church? not. Probably not. Um, possibly. Today we might refer to somebody like that in our church as a head elder. Yeah. If yeah. the pastor wasn't there. Yeah, something like that, probably. <clears throat> and the question would be, um, do you think he'd ever ask Jesus to do anything at church or at the synagogue? Prior to that. I mean, there's no way he could not know about Jesus' presence and what he stood and what, what he stood for and what he represented. My question would be, which synagogue are we talking about? The one in Capernaum. Okay, okay. This would be the main synagogue in Capernaum. There may have been more than one. Yeah. Uh, but probably it's the main synagogue. And if you travel to Capernaum, as I did uh, a couple summers ago, um, you they're pretty sure they know exactly where it is. There's, there's, a, there's actually a church built on the site of what was almost certainly the old synagogue. Yeah. Um, so it just so happened that as this girl is deteriorating into death, uh, Jesus has just returned from a visit to the other side of the Lake, Lake Galilee. And Jairus just rushes down there because his daughter is very seriously ill. And he says, Jesus, come quick. I mean, if your daughter was sick and Jesus was in the area, what would you do? I'd be the first. <laughs> I don't think there's any question about that, right? There's nobody else around that had the power to, that kind of power. And so he was looking everywhere for Jesus. Jesus showed up in the boat and he just says, come quick to my house, my daughter's dying. And of course, everybody else wants a piece of Jesus as he's walking along the way and they're crowding him and so forth. And um, what happened? Next in the story, don't need to get, don't need to go there now. Don't need to go there now. The girl's dead, and it's hard to imagine what the father thought. I mean, he, it turns out that he had tried to get some help, and now the girl's dead. He wasn't even there for her in the last minutes of her life. He must have felt very bad about that. And Jesus said, "What? Don't worry. Don't worry. I'm coming to your house." So um, he said, don't be afraid, only believe and she will be well. Well, Jesus proceeded to the place and the mourners were already, and probably paid mourners, were out there wailing away and making all kinds of noise. So you could probably hear it all over town. And uh, 
What did Jesus say to them? She's only sleeping. She's only sleeping, and they laughed at him. <laughs> what, are you, what, what do you know? Where did you come from? Yeah? And what did Jesus do? He took his three closest disciples into the house with the mother and the father, and he said to the girl, according to, you remember what, uh, what Peter says using the, the Aramaic, one of the few places where we have the actual Aramaic that Jesus spoke? Talitha kum. Get up, little girl. Get up. And she got up. And Jesus, instead of rushing out and saying, guess what I just did? <laughs> or letting anybody else rush out and say, just what I just did. He said, she's been sick for a while. She's hungry. Get her something to eat. So here's a case where Jesus is concerned not only for women, but for a young girl. <clears throat> I have a question back there mm -hmm. about the words. Now, in the good news, it just says, get up, child. Yeah. So is it in the King James that it has those Well, it's in, words? are you in Mark? Uh, Luke. No, you need to go to Mark. Okay. Peter, in the, in the book of Mark, is the one who has the Aramaic. Okay. If you're looking for Aramaic, you've got to go to Mark. Yeah. If Jesus raised her from the dead, why couldn't he raise her with a, with a, with a satisfied <laughs> appetite? <laughs> <laughs> with a sandwich. Raise well, him up no. hungry. Okay, hold on just a minute. He could have. <laughs> he could have. Is that what's going to happen at the end? We're all going to, when Possibly. he comes a second time, we're all going to raise up hungry? Well, would you rather rise up hungry or have your first heavenly meal? Well, well you know, I guess I'd go with the second. It's an <laughs> indirect way of absolutely proving she's alive. Yeah. <clears throat> but, but more than that, it teaches us a very important lesson. Every detail of our lives matters to the Lord Jesus Christ. Get her something to eat. Those people out there can carry on with their morning. Well, they'll find out soon enough that she's alive. They wouldn't. I'm sure they didn't believe it until they saw her walking around. Right. Anyway, you know. Yeah, it gives her, gives her parents uh, a sense that they're contributing at least some to this. Yeah. To this. Uh, well, backing up a few moments, uh, we don't know exactly how long, what happened on the way to Jairus' house? There was a crowd and... A huge uh, crowd. Among many people who touched Jesus, there was one who touched in faith. Yeah. A woman who had been sick, having bleeding for 12 years. Try to imagine it. I had a patient just a couple days ago. I had to call her up and said, get into the hospital. Her hemoglobin was four, for those of you who know what a hemoglobin of four <laughs> means. She's got about a third the amount of blood she's supposed to have. And uh, same problem. Serious stuff. I can more than imagine it. I went through that because I had uh, fibroids so huge mm -hmm. and I was bleeding so much. I would get out of my car. By the time I reached the front door, I'd have blood in my shoes. Mm. Yeah, you, I felt like a leper. You would almost think like, it was yeah. awful. Yeah. Not good. So this lady just, you know, you can imagine. She had probably come some distance. Ellen White suggests that she had come some distance. She heard about Jesus. She had traveled some distance. She gets close, and she thinks, well, I'm going to go there, and I'm going to talk to Jesus. I'm going to tell him about my problem, and he's going to fix it. And she gets there, and all of a sudden she realizes there's a crowd. There's no way that she's going to get any chance to talk to Jesus. Finally, she says, well, if I could just get close enough to touch him. And she did. And, and Jesus her, said, what? What made her think that? I think she realized that that's probably as much as she was going to be able to get away with. Best mm -hmm. chance she had. Yeah, the best chance she had. I, I, and I think, she would, I think she would have said, even if she didn't get healed, I at least got that close yeah. mm -hmm. to healing. But also how little it takes yeah. for Christ to accept us, mm -hmm. that she didn't have to go through any kind of a, no. of a ritual or a ceremony no. or anything, that just that m slight touch yeah. was, hit, was receptive to him. And she knew immediately that she was well. Were you uh, going to say something, Bob? I think she was drawn. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. Think, I think the Spirit was drawing her to Jesus. Absolutely. And when she saw the situation, she says, I'm going to do everything that I can do. And let 
the rest be there. And she could get to touch his hem, and mm -hmm. that's what she could do. And another, another lesson there might be, um, we all have different, um, different ideas about what, what we need to do to touch Jesus. And it doesn't make any difference what your idea is, however perfect or imperfect it might be, or, yeah. or correct or incorrect. Doesn't make a difference. You reach out and you make that touch and you're going to get a response. And Jesus said, your faith <clears throat> has made you well. Mm -hmm. Your faith has made you well. For those of you who are interested, you will see on our, on our screen there that this story is spelled out in considerable detail, in wonderful detail, I might add, in Desire of Ages, page 343 to 347. But just think of all the people that day who are trying to get close to Jesus. Maybe there are other people trying to speak to him, jostling and carry on. And Jesus, one lady, just reaches and barely touches the edge of his garment. And he says, stop. Somebody touched me. Yeah. What was, the difference, what was different about her touch? I don't know. It, it, it raises a bit of a question, though, doesn't it? I, I think, doesn't it say is that King James was somewhere, he felt the virtue go out of him? Mm hmm Maybe he saw her, or maybe he did both. A, a, you, you wonder in a crowd like that, they're all got to be jostling around him. Now, <laughs> we need to understand, it's important, I think, for us to understand the rest of the picture. This woman, by Levitical law, was mm -hmm. unclean. Mm -hmm. She was not supposed to be within about 20 feet of any other person. And she says, forget all that. <laughs> I'm going to get as close as I can, Jesus. Your faith has made you whole. And well, Jesus recognized her as a daughter of Abraham. There were a lot of other people in that, uh, in that crowd, too, wanting things. They were there mm -hmm. for certain things, too. Yeah. There's a couple other stories in there here that we, we need to, to look at in a little more detail. Look at um, Luke 7, starting with verse 36. A Pharisee invited Jesus to have dinner with him. Now, how often do you think that happened? Well, early on, it might have been more frequent than we have a record of. It was later on they started to tighten yeah. up the thumb screws. But it <coughs> didn't take very long. They were already looking for his life after like the first year of his ministry. And Jesus went to his house and sat down to eat. In that town was a woman who lived a sinful life. She heard that Jesus was eating in the Pharisee's house, so she brought an alabaster jar full of perfume and stood behind Jesus by his feet, crying and wetting his feet with her tears. Then she dried his feet with her hair, kissed them, and poured the perfume on them. When the Pharisee saw this, he said to himself, If this man really were a prophet, he would know who this woman is who is touching him. He would know what kind of sinful life she lives. Jesus spoke up and said to, Simon, said to him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Yes, teacher, he said, tell me. There were two men who owed money to a moneylender, Jesus began. One owed him 500 silver coins and the other owed him 50. Neither of them could pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both. Which one then will love him more? I suppose, answered Simon, then it will be the one who was given more. You're right, said Jesus. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, he turned to the woman, notice this, he turned to the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your home and you gave me no water from my feet. But she has washed my feet with her tears and dried them with her hair. You did not welcome me with a kiss, but she has not stopped kissing my feet since I came. You provided no olive oil from my head, but she has covered my feet with perfume. I tell you then, the great love she has shown proves that her many sins have been forgiven. But whoever has been forgiven little shows only a little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The others sitting at the table began to say to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? But Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. And another word for saved you is healed you. Yeah, exactly. Well, there's more to the story if we want to accept what Ellen White has written. Look at these words. Simon had led into sin the woman he now despised. She had been deeply wronged by him. But Simon felt himself more righteous than Mary, and Jesus desired him to see how great his guilt really was. He would show him that his sin was greater than hers. 
as much greater as the debt of 500 pence exceeds the debt of 50 pence. Desire of Ages 566, paragraph 5. So who was the sinner in those two group, between those two? Those diamond was the worst. Those present, now we turn to Signs of the Times, May 9, 1900. It's also in Daughters of God, page 239, paragraph 4. Those present, thinking of Lazarus, who had been raised from the dead by Christ and who was at this time a guest in his uncle's house, began to question, saying, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? But Christ continued, Thy faith has saved thee. Go in peace. Now, if we had time, we would compare the Gospels together, and we find out that this woman who was pouring perfume on his feet was Mary, and she was the sister of Lazarus. So Mary was led into sin by her own uncle, who was at this point, at this ceremony, despising her because she was a, quote, sinful woman. Where in the Bible does it say that she was a prostitute? I've never found that. Um, no, it's from this sinful woman statement. So, so women sinful, that has to be that. No. <laughs> I, I, I know a few women are sinful that don't do that. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> <laughs> but remember, remember we do have the other evidence elsewhere that she had had seven demons cast out of her. T it, today, after what happened to her, when we think it was maybe a, like a mental illness and all this, or was it actual demon that she had? Oh. Well, the fact that it says he cast seven demons out yeah, of her right. seems to suggest it was more than just a mental illness of some kind. Another question. There are two stories about this, kind of similar, but are we too intimate that this story and the other Mary are one and the same? I don't the story about the women those two, there are two stories. One yeah. seems to be at the beginning of Christ's ministry mm -hmm. and the other at the end. It's really the same story. It's the same woman. Mm -hmm. You know, so, uh, another bit of evidence that might be used to, to indicate that these are real demons is mm -hmm. Jesus casts some demons out of, mm -hmm. out of uh, uh, those two demoniacs and they went into pigs. So if they were just an emotional illness, it's kind of hard to take someone's emotional illness and, and put, it in put that into a pig. It would be interesting to watch, so, wouldn't it? Yeah. Well, one more. Yeah. The, the Bible text <coughs> suggests that Mary was showing a lot more emotion, suggesting that she had, that she was forgiven more mm -hmm. than Simon. Yet Ellen White, as I see these texts, suggests the opposite. Help me understand that. Oh, I see what you're saying. Well, I mean, if Simon was the one who led her into sin. I, I, I understand that, but uh, that he was probably the greater sinner. But what, what was Jesus meaning by the f 50 shillings or 50 gold coins and yeah. 500 gold coins then? He was, he was saying that Simon was 10 times more guilty than Mary. Yeah. As a Pharisee, remember this guy is a proud Pharisee who lives just outside of Jerusalem. He's one of the inside crowd. And she has left home because of her sin, left home, gone up to Galilee, lived in Magdala for, for some time. That's why she came to be known as Mary Magdalene and ended up being possessed by seven demons. And then <coughs> look, what, look what we read in the very next chapter. Sometime later, Jesus traveled through towns and villages preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. The 12 <coughs> disciples went with him and so did some women who had been healed of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had been driven out, Joanna, whose husband Chusa was an officer in Herod's court, and Susanna, and many other women who used their own resources to help Jesus and his disciples. So the, 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 what scholars believe is the reason this story in chapter 7 is moved up here to the first part of ministry is Luke wants you to recognize that this is the, the lady he's going to talk about all through his gospel. Is Simon the Pharisees, Simon the leper? Yes, same. Yes, Bob. It seems to me how easy it is for us to justify ourselves in our own eyes oh, and yeah. not see anything wrong with what we're doing and hear somebody else that's doing these horrible things that everybody knows that they're doing yeah. and we can disfellowship them or whatever we want to do 
But you know what I do is right in my own eyes. Yeah. Well, let me just read a comment about that. When to human eyes her case appeared hopeless, Christ saw in Mary capabilities for good. He saw the better traits of her character. They, the plan of redemption has invested humanity with great possibilities. And in Mary, these possibilities were to be realized. Through his grace, she became a partaker of the divine nature. This woman, this woman went from prostitution and demon possession to partaking of the divine nature. Think Amen. about that. The one who had fallen and whose mind had been a habitation of demons was brought very near to the Savior in fellowship and ministry. It was Mary who sat at his feet and learned of him. So here's the way we, we Ellen White for sure associates these two. It was Mary who poured upon his head the precious anointing oil and bathed his feet with her tears. Mary stood beside the cross and followed him to the sepulcher. Mary was first at the tomb after his resurrection. It was Mary who first proclaimed a risen Savior. Wow, what a life story. You know, just a, you know, it, it's hard for me to even imagine it. Just try to take it all in. Well, look at Luke 10, 38 to 42. This is a very, very significant passage. As Jesus and his disciples went on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha welcomed her him in her home. She had a sister named Mary. So you see almost immediately she's talking more about <coughs> Martha and Mary. So he wants you to, to know about this story. Um, she had a sister named Mary who sat down at the feet of the Lord and listened to his teaching. Martha was upset over all the work she had to do. So she came and said, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her to come and help me. The Lord answered her, Mary, uh, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled over so many things, but just one is needed. Mary has chosen the right thing, and it will not be taken from her. Now, some of you are aware that some very interesting comments have been made about that. Well, let's just hit the, 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 the st background story. We've already mentioned this. Mary was the black sheep of the family having left home, become a prostitute, even finally being demon-possessed before Jesus cast out seven demons from her life. Almost certainly, Jesus met her in Galilee. And finally, after her life has been completely transformed, she probably traveled home and said, guess what, I'm a new me. And Martha is now saying, glory, hallelujah, we don't have the black sheep has gone out of the family, uh, and, and, you know, and we're going to welcome Jesus who made this transformation in my sister's life. But now she's not behaving herself. Now the master is in their home. Martha felt a great need to show her respect for the one who had done so much for her family. But Mary realized that the presence of Jesus was too precious to be wasted on ordinary matters. And she sat at the feet of Jesus. And once again, Ellen White says, the cause of Christ needs careful, energetic workers. There's a wide field for the Marthas with their zeal and active religious work. But let them first sit with Mary at the feet of Jesus. Let diligence, promptness, and energy be sanctified by the grace of Christ. Then the life will be an unconquerable power for good. Desire of Ages 525, paragraph 2. But there's a deeper meaning to this short story, which follows right after the story of the Good Samaritan. Okay? And I'm going to take the liberty of reading a little bit longer passage here and let you comment about it as, as we go along. If you thought the Good Samaritan was radical, why was it so radical? Jesus places a Samaritan on a higher level than his fellow Jews. Unthinkable, right? So if you thought that story was radical, this powerful little story suggests that Luke has plenty more where that came from. In describing Jesus' journey to Jerusalem, he has, cho he has chosen this incident as part of his introduction. It took place at Bethany, as we know from other accounts of these sisters, and Bethany was not far from Jerusalem. Near, in fact, to the top of the road described in the parable we've just studied. Talking about the, the road that goes down to Jericho. The incident can't, therefore, have taken place at this point in the story. In other words, Lucas felt free to sort of move the stories around to fit 
the progress of what he's trying to say. But Luke has placed it here to alert us to something special about Jesus' work. Not only was he redrawing the boundaries of God's people, sending out a clear message about how the gospel would reach to those outside the traditional borders. I'm going to stop there for a second. Can you think of any other times when Jesus said, did, said and did things that reached outside of their traditional borders? Talking to the woman at the well in Samaria. Wonderful. Talking to the woman at the well of Samaria. And what did she do? Converted the village. Yes. She basically spread the gospel. You know, she was the best messenger Jesus had probably in his whole lifetime. You know, although I could, some of other people that we're going to talk about in a moment they had pretty impact, incredible impact as well. What other place did he have an impact outside of Galilee and Judea? Remember? He traveled across the lake in a boat. Cast he landed on the shore and he did what? Put the demons into a flock of pigs. Cast out a, a horde of demons into a flock of pigs who ran down the, the, the slope and into, drowned in the Sea of Galilee. And I always jokingly think about my Jewish friends and say, I wonder if any of them dared eat anything out of the Sea of Galilee for the next couple of years. <laughs> With all that big deterioration in there. Anyway, so not only, <laughs> so what did those two, what did Jesus say to those two demon-possessed men that he'd cast the demons out of? Go, Go home and tell people what has happened to you. And what happened when Jesus came back to that territory about three months later? Well, I don't believe it. Thousands. Thousands of people came out. In fact, he fed four, after they'd been there three days, he finally said, we've got to feed these people. He fed 4,000 men, not counting women and children. So here we have examples of two non-Jewish, two non-Jewish examples. The Samaritan woman who basically brought the message to her whole village. Two formerly demon-possessed men that brought the message to their entire region, thousands of people. How many Jews did that well? How many disciples of Jesus while during his ministry did that well the great big fat zero wow amazing well getting on with our story jesus was redrawing the boundaries between men and women within israel blurring lines which have been clearly laid down the real problem between martha and mary wasn't the workload that martha had in the kitchen that no doubt was real enough, but it wasn't the main thing that was upsetting Martha. Nor was it, as some have suggested, that both the sisters were romantically attracted to Jesus and Martha was jealous of Mary's adoring posture sitting at Jesus' feet. Now, I, I, I don't know. I've never been a woman, and uh, <laughs> so maybe I'm wrong, but I would guess that almost every woman in the area was attracted to Jesus. I think I would be. What, you're you're proposing here with your last few statements here that <clears throat> Jesus is 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 he's wandering away from his purpose of enlightening the world of the gospel and gone into social engineering here. No, I'm not. Yes. I'm suggesting that this is part of the gospel. My goodness. <laughs> <laughs> That's well, even more radical, huh? <laughs> <laughs> but it, well, but but to, yeah, okay, go ahead. I was going to say, but it, but it really is part of the gospel. You mm -hmm. go to the highlands of New Guinea, there are still areas where you're a wealthy man according to the number of pigs or yep. pieces of pearl you might have traded from the coast to get it. Yeah. And when they get uh, converted, there is a total change. That's mm -hmm. social engineering at its very raw yep. base. So what was going on as Mary is sitting at the feet of Jesus? Well, if there was any such feeling, any about a romantic rivalry between the sisters, Luke neither says nor hints anything about it. No, the real problem was that Mary was behaving as if she were a man. Now, we're not talking about lesbians here or some kind of gay thing. Mary was behaving as if she were a man. Let's, let's read on. In By that, the way, who are you quoting from? Maybe you should say that. Oh, this is line. from a, a New Testament scholar um, in, in our day. In that culture, as in many parts of the world to this day, houses were divided into male space 
and female space. And male and female roles were strictly demarcated as well. Mary had crossed an invisible but very important boundary within the house and another equally important boundary within the social world. What had she, had, what had she done? Well, she not only acted as a man, but as a disciple, oh. as a learner. How did she get away yeah. with that? <coughs> well, the public room, which is where the men would meet and eat, by the way, the kitchen and other, uh, the public room was where the men would meet. The kitchen and other quarters unseen by outsiders belonged to the women. Only outside where little children would play and in the married bedroom would male and female mix. For a woman to settle down comfortably among the men was bordering on the scandalous. Who did she think she was? Only a shameless woman, now remember what her history is, only a shameless woman would behave in such a way. She should go back into the women's quarters where she belonged. This wasn't principally a matter of superiority and inferiority, though no doubt it was often perceived and articulated like that. It was a matter of what was thought of as the appropriate division between the two halves of humanity. In the same way, to sit at the feet of a teacher was a decidedly male role. Sitting at someone's feet doesn't mean, as it might sound to us, a devoted, dog-like, adoring posture, as though the teacher were a rock star or a sports idol. When Saul of Tarsus sat at the feet of Gamaliel, what do you suppose he was doing? Diligently studying. Diligently studying, and he soon became what? Probably the youngest member of the Sanhedrin that ever happened, right? So sitting at the feet of somebody means what? You're male. What, 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 what You're about, listening, taking instruction. <clears throat> what about when Ruth went and sat at the feet of Boaz? Well, that was quite a long time <laughs> earlier, but see, that was an invitation to get married, wasn't it? And no overtones of romantic relationship here? Well, in the Ruth story, yeah, she was a widow. Yeah, and this, so this was a, a cultural thing that was adopted and that, that was a present in the time of Jesus and not necessarily in the time of Boaz or earlier cultures. I, I, I well, <coughs> I don't know. I, let's not go into that. Okay. That, that could be a complicated subject. We're, we're, we're talking, what, uh, 1,200 years difference, and so things probably had changed some at least. So, when Saul of Tarsus sat at the feet of Gamaliel, he wasn't gazing up adoringly and thinking how wonderful the great rabbi was. He was listening and learning, focusing on the teaching of his master and putting it together in his mind. To sit at the, someone's feet meant quite simply to be their student. And to sit at the feet of a rabbi was what you did if you wanted to be a rabbi yourself. There's no thought here of learning, to, uh, of learning for learning's sake. Mary had quietly taken her place as a would-be teacher and preacher of the kingdom of God. Now, we already read the passage from two, two chapters earlier in Luke 8, the first three verses, saying that Mary had been doing what? Following Jesus. Following Jesus for a long time and helping to support him with her own means. So she felt very comfortable sitting at his feet and learning from him. She had done it many times already. Would it be pushing credulity too far? She, if she came from a Pharisaic background, she was probably educated. Mm -hmm. In fact, the lesson pamphlet mentions Mary, the mother of Christ, and infers that she knew a lot about Scripture. So somewhere these women in that kind of situation mm -hmm. you describe had access to the Scriptures. <coughs> So in one sense, you can understand uh, Mary, when her mind was clear, she realized she was dealing with somebody who really knew what was going on. Well, you did mention it was possible that Mary and Martha were from a pharisaical family. Yes. So yeah. they could have been, even though if they may have been in the next room, they could have heard conversations and debates. Among yeah, them. yeah. <coughs> now, Jesus, of course, said, get back in the kitchen, right? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Jesus affirms her right to sit at his feet. This has little to do with women's movements in the modern West. 
they do have some parallels with Jesus' agenda, and the two can make common cause on several issues, but they should not be confused. Jesus' evaluation of each human being is based not on abstract egalitarian ideals, but on the overflowing love of God, which, like a great river breaking its banks into parched countryside, irrigates those parts of the human society which until now had remained barren and unfruitful. Mary stands for all those women who, when they hear Jesus speaking about the kingdom, know that God is calling them to listen carefully so that they can speak of it too. We would be wrong then to see Mary and Martha as they have so often been seen as models of the active and the contemplative styles of spirituality. Action and contemplation are, of course, both important. Without the first, you wouldn't eat. Without the second, you wouldn't worship. And no doubt some people are called to one kind of balance between them and others to, um, and others to another. But we cannot escape the challenge of this passage by turning it into a comment about different types of Christian lifestyle. It is about the boundary-breaking call of Jesus. Jesus, if you, if you look through his story and you realize what's going on there, he repeatedly repeatedly broke down all the barriers and all the boundaries he possibly could. It was just the, Gen the Jewish Gentile barrier, the Jew Samaritan barrier, the man woman barrier, the, you know, and on and on and on. As he goes up to Jerusalem, he leaves behind him towns, villages, households, and individuals who have glimpsed a new vision of the kingdom and for whom life will never be the same again. God grant that as we read his story, the same will be true of us. This was written by N.T. Wright uh, in, the, in a commentary entitled Luke for Everyone, <coughs> pages 129 to 130. Okay, another parable. Look at Luke 18, 1 to 8. And Jesus told his disciples a parable to teach them that they should always pray and never become discouraged. In a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected people. And there was a widow in that same town who kept coming to him and pleading for her rights, saying, Help me against my opponent. For a long time the judge refused to act, but at last he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or respect people, yet because of all the trouble this widow is giving me, I will see to it that she gets her rights. If I don't, she will keep on coming and finally wear me <laughs> out. Now... <coughs> And the Lord continued, listen to what uh, that woman, I'm sorry, that corrupt judge said. Now will God not, not judge in favor of his own people who cry to him day and night for help? Will he be slow to help them? I tell you, he will judge in their favor and do it quickly. But will the Son of Man find faith on earth when he comes? What do we learn from that story? Verse 1 says it all. Yeah. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to teach them that they should always pray and never become discouraged. Okay. So when praying for something that we think is God's will, <coughs> we need to be persistent. Persistence in prayer doesn't change God. It doesn't mean if you, change, if you pray five times, he's more likely to hear you than if you pray one. Who does it change? Us. Yeah, it changes us. Well, but yeah, but how does that change the outcome? Well, it the makes idea is to get an outcome here, and it changes you because you you have become more and more a person of prayer and faith, and God can say that kind of person I can work with. So He can answer your prayer. Yes, because you've changed, and prayer can change even the heart of an evil judge. And victorious faith is persistent faith. Christ Obby Lessons, page 165. Yes. I think it also shows that when we are persistent in prayer, <clears throat> that we may see another solution as the answer to the prayer than what we first asked for. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, exactly. Well, there's another very famous uh, story that we need to cover fairly quickly here about two men who went down to pray in the square. And who were they? Pharisees. Pharisee and the tax collector. Pharisee and the tax player, collector. And when the Pharisees prayed, what were they? What was their prayer? 
loud. Well, <laughs> I thank you, Lord, that I'm not like this tax collector over here, right? Opposite ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Incredible, incredible. And what did the fa what did the tax collector pray? He Beating on his breast, yeah. he said, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And which one of them was helped by God? Which one of them was actually changed by God? The tax collector. Tax collector. Yeah. Oh. There's another story, yes. Yeah. Uh, I just think that the, that the, the publican <laughs> received the knowledge of God's love in his heart, and the Pharisee never did. Yeah. The other short story is Jesus is in the temple. And once again, I'm sure he went right to that very spot on purpose. He was actually in the section of the temple, temple courts, basically, that was for women. And what was in the, in the women's court? The offering plates. Mm -hmm. We wouldn't want to put the offering plates somewhere where the women couldn't get, women couldn't get to them, would we? <laughs> we want to make sure that the offering plates are available to everybody, right? So Jesus is quietly w watching. He's pretending like he's not watching, I'm sure. And this woman sneaks up and she, you know, she, Ellen White says she, she, she stepped back when some of these people came with their big bags full of coins to throw in and so forth like this. And finally, when she thinks nobody's looking, what does she do? Looks over and drops her She drops her two little, I, I once bought one of those when I was in, in Jerusalem. Uh, <coughs> these things are tiny little copper coins. They're so big you can almost lose them in your hand. She put these two copper coins in the offering when the, they were big jars kind of things. And what do you suppose happened to those two <coughs> copper coins when they were counting them later? Probably thrown out. <laughs> I think when you're counting a whole bunch of gold coins and you come to these two little chintzy little copper things, the Pharisees and the, especially the Sadducees who were in charge of the temple services probably just chucked them out. But there's a very important lesson for us in this. And what did Jesus say about this woman? She gave more. She gave more than all the others. Why? She gave because all she had. The, the, uh, the one, the notable, who thought he was in love with himself and not much else, uh, he, he wasn't given his all. He was given maybe part of the interest of his investments. And that, those two little ta copper coins that that woman put in, teach us two very important lessons. The first one is this. God calls us to be generous in our offerings. If, if anybody had a reason to think, I'm not going to give any money to this corrupt organization, it would have been that woman and the Sadducees. But the people today who say, well, I'm not going to give my money to the church because look what so-and-so is doing, look at so-and-so and so, that's absolutely forbidden by this story. This woman gave her two copper coins and Jesus said that was the right thing to do even though those copper coins might have even been just thrown out by the Sadducees when they were counting the money. So if we, are not, we don't like what's happening in the church, there are separate ways to deal with that, not to just withhold your offerings. That's not the appropriate answer. But what else did he say about this? See, he said wherever the gospel is preached, what's going to happen? her story is going to be told. And as a result, that, those two little copper coins are going to result in more generous gifts being given to the church down through the, gener the ages than ever, ever, ever were given by the scribes and Pharisees or the Sadducees for that matter in those offering pots at the temple. Well, look at, um, we have time I think to do this really quickly. Look at Luke 23, starting with verse 55. The women who had followed Jesus from Galilee went with Joseph and saw the tomb and how Jesus' body was placed in it. <coughs> then they went back home and prepared the spices and perfumes for the body. On the Sabbath they rested as the law commanded. Very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb carrying the spices they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the entrance to the tomb, and so they went in, but they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. They stood there puzzled about this when suddenly two men in bright, shining clothes stood by them. Full of fear, the woman bowed down to the ground as the men said to them, Why are you looking among the dead for one who's alive? He is not here. He has been raised. Remember what he said to you while he was in Galilee. 
the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners, be crucified, and three days later rise to life. You know, Ken, the title of this lesson is Women in the Ministry of Jesus, but uh, it's all in a supportive role. There's no leadership role here. They can follow along. And you mean Jesus wasn't a woman? No. I'm just <laughs> saying here that the, the, all the illustrations here that we've brought or that the author of the Sabbath School lesson or whatever has brought here are, and it could be argued that it's all a supportive role in the, you know, in the New Testament. There's no, there aren't any, and of course we didn't get through all our notes here. Maybe no. if we got through there we'd find somebody, but there's nobody here that was sent out among the twelve. What about a woman who was <coughs> sent to give the very first preaching of the gospel to the General Conference Committee? Hmm. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> it was the formerly demon-possessed prostitute who was the first one to see Jesus, as, recognize him anyway, and who was sent, go and tell the disciples and Peter, I will meet them in Galilee. Well, if you look today, um, in our time, who did Jesus choose to give direct dreams mm. and visions to? Uh, Ellen White, if you yeah. believe that. And um, the men in that time, after 1888, decided she'd be better off leaving the country mm -hmm. instead of listening to her words. So, Well, why do you suppose it was that the women were there on Sunday morning and the men were not? Where were the disciples on Sunday morning? Hiding. Hiding. In a locked room, in a locked room, in an upper room, trying, hoping nobody knows where they were. And here are the women proceeding there, right down to the grave and saying, please, they thought they were going to say to the Roman guard, please roll the stone back so we can put perfume and spices on the body. So why did they dare to do that? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One, the Roman guard probably would not have bothered with women. They're just women. Let them do what they want to do. You know, There was that aspect to it. But there's another aspect to it. These women were determined to do what they thought was right, and they did it. And of course, they didn't find the body, and they therefore ended up being the first ones to announce the wonderful good news that's such good news to all of us, the good news of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. If you want to <coughs> learn more about all this material, you're welcome to go to our website, and you can get the handout that we've been working on and I hope you'll find it to be as a great a blessing as we have found it to be. Our kind and wonderful Father, we thank you for these notes, these few words of wisdom from your scriptures and from others who have thought about the issues. Forgive us where we might have been part of any kind of a group that despised others or looked down on others. May we also be part of those who will break down barriers and welcome sinners into your kingdom is our prayer in Jesus' name.